So despite the, the fears and despite the concerns, you decided to go ahead with this revival. Deacon Turner, what prompted you to do this? Actually, the, the man right off to my right, Monsignor, um, Monsignor Rich, yeah, I called him, you know, a little concerned about safety and so forth. And, uh, and his first response immediately was, if there is any night that the church doors need to be open, it's tonight. So we had planned a revival for two or 300 people. And he said, look, if we have a prayer circle of two or three people, the doors of the church will be open tonight. And uh, thankfully, uh, out of all the places in Baltimore to be, there was true sanctuary in the church. The first night we had 150 people. Uh, last night, despite the curfew, we had closer to 300 people, mostly young people last night. Mm -hmm. And we're gonna do it again tonight, you know, again, despite the curfew. Um, mm -hmm. So if there's blessing. any night. What a blessing. Any night. Monsignor yeah. Rich, how long did it take you to come to that decision? It was really never a doubt in my mind. Um, you know, I live at the church, so I knew I was going to be there. <laughs> and I just knew that, you know, this was a time of prayer. And uh, again, if one person showed up, I would have sat down with them. We would have held hands. We would have prayed for our city. And if 200 people showed up, we would have a revival. Myron, so, yeah. were, you, were you at all concerned about going through with this revival? Did, did that ever cross your mind? No, because... I believe that there's a reason for everything, and the reason we did the revival was because why put Jesus on hope? Mm. Jesus is the reason for the season. That's what I believe anyway. Okay, um, and, and Jihad, do you do you do you feel the same way? Yes. Um, not that what I'm saying was like reason why I went through with the revival and went to the revival is because God blessed me with this school, the people around me and the program that I met. And um, I just wanted to praise you back. Basically. Amen. So, Amen yeah. to that young man. How do you both feel about the fact that you are now part of a marker in history? Do you realize that? Has that settled in to your minds right now? That what's going on in your city right now now puts you at a very, very specific point, not only in the history of, of Baltimore, but in the history of the nation. Jihad, I want to start with you. How do you feel? Um, it's, I feel I got mixed feelings this because me coming up in the community and society, um, uh, where we were taught to call on people and stuff like that when stuff wasn't going right mm -hmm. or wrong or whatever. But now it's a, it's not it's like in my head I hesitate it, it, I hesitate sometimes. Everybody's not the same but it's just like one person if the first impression was like was just it's probably the last one you have to get. Okay, I understand what you're saying. Myron, do you feel the same way? How do you, how do you feel about what's happening right now? What do you tell your, your peers? What do you tell your friends? I honestly believe that is a, it is a blessing because something had to be done. Um, justice needed to be served, um, and I pray that justice will be served before Friday. Okay, and, and Deacon Turner, we tend to move on to the next tragedy, it seems, these days. You know, whatever is uh, trending on Twitter and Facebook, how are we going to keep Baltimore relevant? How are we going to keep what's happening there relevant, the changes that you need relevant? You know, it's interesting to hear you say that because this revival was planned months ago. Um, you know, we talked about how we saw this coming. We didn't see it coming quite this dramatically, but... You know, we're here in the city every day when the news media is not. Um, we've been fighting this battle every day when the news media doesn't pay attention. Mm -hmm. So when something like this flashes up, uh, you know, one thing to understand is that places like St. Bernardine's Catholic Church, our school, St. Francis Academy, have been here for decades. The mm -hmm. new St. Francis Academy in particular has been here since 1828. So yeah, our original mission was to teach the children of slaves to read the Bible. And, uh, and back then in Baltimore, that wasn't exactly the friendliest place for us to be either. Uh, uh, it was against the law in the slave state of Maryland to do what we were doing. Okay. So we've been fighting this battle literally since slavery, through the Civil War, through the Civil Rights Movement, through 
two or three, you know, two world wars, mm -hmm. uh, Vietnam War. I, yeah, we've been here the whole time. The so we saw this time. coming. Yes. And, uh, and our hope is that, that um, you're right, once the media attention dies away, that, that people will know that our kids and our schools are still here fighting that same battle. And Monsignor Rich, I want you to have the, the, the last word in the 30 seconds. We talk about peace, we talk about prayer, we talk about unity. Is anybody listening? I think lots of people are listening. I think one of the, the main impressions that's being given is that Baltimore isn't a city of peace and justice. And it, it is, it truly is. And uh, the, the, the residents are concerned. We, we want justice. We want the answers to what happened, not only to Freddie Gray, but uh, continually throughout time uh, in terms of relationship with law enforcement and neighborhoods. Mm -hmm. uh, but we also always have, have wanted peace, and we work for that okay. every day.